not knowing the fact that you won the Bakyani Prize. And unfortunately, you couldn't come to Korea, but you got to say something to Korean uh, readers. Um, I think it's, it's one of the most exciting things that's happened to me. And it was completely unexpected. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I had this sort of heap of letters. Yeah. And I opened three or four, and then suddenly mm -hmm. there was this extraordinary letter saying you have won the prize. Ah. And um, I rushed, I took it to my husband, I said, look at this, look at this. Oh, I won something. <laughs> but um, partly because of Yonbom, mm -hmm. I've always cared about Korea. Oh. So then I read the novel of the lady the prize is named for. Mm -hmm. What is her name? Park. Park Young Ni. Yeah, Park Young Ni. Mm -hmm. And um, I really was very impressed by that. Mm -hmm. I was going to ask you, am I allowed to ask you questions? No, no problem. Um, that, what I read in English of her book, yeah. It's very cut down because mm. I gather it's 11 books mm. and I've got, and it reads cut down. Mm. Do you think they will do it longer? It's very exciting, but it's, it's frustrating to read mm. because you can feel yeah. somebody cutting and cutting right, and cutting. Right. Very artificial. Mm. Yeah. I think it's been done quite well. How can I tell? But yeah. uh, you keep reading, but I have this. I must stop talking about this. I have this dreadful feeling uh -huh. that I would know all these characters in immense depth and complexity, and instead it's rushing along in order to yeah. cut it down and to keep going. Yeah. Anyway, it's very, very interesting. So maybe there are some kind of something in common between Park Young Lee, the Korean author, and you. As a female writer, is talking about the human value of life and the love of nature. So I was listening to some of your interview that that is posted on YouTube. So you're talking about like the, some kind of your feminist perspective of being a novelist. That what do you think about? Uh, I'm very troubled by feminism mm. because I've always felt. I want to be a writer, mm -hmm. not a woman writer. Yeah. Um, although I was sitting here last night feeling ill and thinking about your questions mm. and I thought, um, who are the British writers mm -hmm. I really love? And in fact they're women, mm -hmm. or at least well there's Dickens, but also George Eliot, yes. Jane Austen. Um, Very popular in Korea too. Mm. Yeah. Iris Murdoch? Yeah, I heard of yeah. her too. It's, um, I mean, it's, it's very good to be... I spend a lot of time in France mm. and the French don't have this sense of mm. men and women all writing. It's odd if the women write mm. and when they write, they write about women. Mm. Whereas We've always had great women writers who write about everything, and yeah. this is this is what hurrah for George Eliot. Mm. Mm -hmm. That uh, you have long been a renowned, renowned writer worldwide, but originally you were an academic researcher, right? So there are some uh, curiosity from Korean audience that are. Uh, was being an academic scholar and now became a very well-known writer. So you kind of switched your position to write and think over the social issues. So this whole transformation of your perspective and position, how does it affect the way you write your stories? Um, I think I'm fortunate to be as old as I am mm. because when I started reading and writing, there wasn't this sense of the professional critic mm -hmm. in the same way. So if if I taught, I taught the books. And I used to teach, um, I think this was immensely important to me, I used to teach extramural mm -hmm. university teaching. I taught adults and they all had degrees in different mm -hmm. things. They weren't people who were professional students of literature. 
and I taught them the books as the books were written by people like Dickens and George Eliot and Henry James yeah. for readers. And so I didn't have this sense, which I think was very good for me, I didn't have this sense of the study of literature as a profession in the same way mm. as it is now, mm. or as it was when I was teaching. I, I came to be a teacher. I taught American literature um, mm. by sheer accident. Um, I was given a scholarship to go to America mm. after Cambridge, yeah. and the scholarship required me to be studying American literature, mm. <laughs> which was not what interested me. I, I care about European literature. Yeah. But I got interested in American literature. Anyway. Yes, well, <laughs> things are interesting. Right. But I'm still, I'm still not an American specialist, really. I am. I, f I find the Americans much more alien mm. than the Europeans. Alien? What do you mean by that? I'm like, um, <laughs> very curious. <laughs> well, alien, alien. They're very obsessed with being American. Oh, yeah. They they, cannot kill. Live yeah. And narrow down interest to define who they are. Narrow and deep. Yeah. I, I, I wouldn't say it was trivial, mm. but it's narrow compared to either the British or mm. the French and the Germans and the Italians. I ought to read the Italians more, but I don't. That actually makes me think the way in each, like in terms of the comparisons between the some kind of a soil of literatures in Europe and in America. In Europe, maybe England is surrounded by many rich country of culture, you know, based on long history of whatever, you know, multiple diversification based on probably some say imperialism, some say colonialism, whatever. But in America, they have been struggling over how to define who they are. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> to get away from the European heritage. No, that's exactly. That's exactly how they are, and um, they're both fascinating and maddening. Mm. But um, I'm trying to think. I did. Uh, I did love um, Moby Dick. Moby Dick. Yeah, I loved some of the big 19th century yeah. American novels, which were still. Well, they weren't European, but they weren't so busy being American. Mm. Um, I think. So what if, like, uh, if I'm asking, how do you feel, you know, so maybe I can ask how lucky you are being a British writer with a, with a very universified mean of expression like English. So I think you're absolutely right. And as, a, as I get older, and I keep getting older and older, I'm more conscious of the fact that I'm very, very lucky. Um, I'm trying to think when it occurred to me I was very lucky simply to have the English language mm -hmm. as a beginning because I started thinking in English yeah. and then I was good at languages so I can think in French and I can right. sort of think in German mm. and Italian and this means I can see English from yeah. two, which is very good, I don't Compact live inside English. Right only, right. and it makes you see just how wonderful English is. And of course, this again, I get, for some reason I keep coming back to George Eliot. Mm. She had languages. Mm. She knew Spanish, she knew French, she knew German. She could think in those languages, whereas Dickens didn't. Mm. Dickens thought in English, and yeah. he thought language was English. And mm. He was a great master of English, but it was different, mm. and um, and George Eliot was a, a European. Yes, yes. Um, so you know, strange, really, because she was a provincial woman mm. with a very narrow background, very religious. As a woman as well. And a woman as well, and an ugly woman. <laughs> uh, oh my! <laughs> which probably was good for her because, but. Um, so anyway, she she's caused a lot of my thinking about being English and British. Mm. I, I I tend to think about English, not British. Mm. I think it 
sometimes the two together, uh -huh. and sometimes the English narrowly English as opposed to Scottish or Welsh or mm -hmm. Canadian or American. Oh, so the Commonwealth language. Mm. Okay. And um, British. Yes, I very rarely think about being British. I, I think about being English, and mm. as I'm speaking to you about being English, there are sort of visual images mm. that come into my mind, um, images of plants mm. and landscapes. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah. more like a European perspective. Like yeah. English is not belong to people living um, in the UK. Maybe uh, English is already internally mixed up with all different languages from mm. different places in Europe. And it's, of course, it's made up of all different languages. Yeah. Um, they all get into English. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Contributing to each other. Like. Mm. And we're quite good at taking over languages. Mm. Great. Mm. Borrowing words. <laughs> yeah. Good, good. Um, I don't think you have been pretty conscious about like when you're writing a books that I have to define my books somehow in terms of uh, British nationals like my book should be about like British national kind of based concern. Probably you was writing what you want to write, but it ended up being probably by interpreted by the critic and reader that oh your book of writing is too much like British or <laughs> English. <laughs> what, what do you think about it? No, no, I think that's a very accurate description of the state of affairs. Um, I think I started writing because the thing I care about is language. Mm. Um, when I think about the meaning of words or words that describe things yeah. in the lands, I, I get very excited and I think about language. I don't think about being British at that level. Mm. It doesn't occupy my my mind in the same way. I mean, anybody with a good mind writing in English will think about Britishness and Englishness. And I do, but I don't think politically. I, I write novels because I'm not political. Mm. I write novels because human beings are complicated and difficult yeah. and endlessly different from each other as well as the same as each other yeah. in unexpected ways. And um, I, I enjoy that. I mean, I, I enjoy it more than anything. But um, there's a whole generation of women younger than me mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that are writing because they want to define what it is to be a woman and to make a place for women in society. And this is good too, I mean, this is necessary, but it isn't what I do or did or started out. And every now and then I find myself, as you were saying, getting yeah. described as though that is right. what, what I'm right. trying to do. And um, So, yeah, actually what you just said makes me think about, like, one part of the way you write story is about, you know, being in, you know, intuitive. Like you have your own keen eye to look and find some truths of human life. But at the same time, you are doing a tremendous amount of work to research things that you have to deal with in your books and with a lot of notes in your <laughs> novels. So it is also like some mixture of different two elements in uh, working out some books. Well, both of its life. Mm. Um, but I am... Um, when I was really very young, I, if I found a reference to a book in a book, mm -hmm. I would read a second book. And when I read Coleridge's Ancient Mariner mm -hmm. and read the scholarship on it, it's, I one love of, it too. <laughs> it's one of the things I love most in the world. But Coleridge did that. If he found anything in a book he was reading, 
yeah. about another book. Right. He read the other book. And then he, he was a critic too. Yeah. Yeah, as a writer. Oh. Exactly. And those are, those are the writers. I love really the ones yeah. who are critics mm -hmm. as well as writers. Exactly. And there isn't a difference. I mean, the Ancient Mariner is one of the most dramatic mm -hmm. poems in any language. Mm -hmm. And yet it is a scholarly work mm -hmm. written by a man who read an enormous amount and used it, mm -hmm. and um, gosh, it, it makes me really happy just to think of Coleridge. It's, uh, yes, I feel that they're mentors uh, rather than objects of study All right. in the end. Mm -hmm. And I feel in some humble way one is having a dialogue with Coleridge. Mm. And wow. one isn't exactly saying, oh yes, how clever of you, but I don't do that. I don't think of him writing when I read him, but I think of his writing. There is Iris Murdoch. Mm. When I met Iris Murdoch's novels first, I was a postgraduate, really, mm -hmm. um, and an ex-boyfriend sent me an oh. Iris Murdoch, and he said, I think you would like this, and he was dead right. I did. Oh, I and. I couldn't understand why her novels were the shape they were. Mm -hmm. So I did a lot of work on her, mm -hmm. and I read all her philosophy and things in order to find out how her mind worked, because that was how my mind worked. Mm -hmm. And then I got to meet her. That was terrifying. That mm -hmm. was awful. Um, and then we became friends, but um, it was... What do you mean by the awful when you met her? She says she was a book, she wasn't a person. <laughs> okay. Uh, and there she was at a bar and she she drank an awful lot of mm. um, brandy, I think it was. And she, well, she kept putting brandy in the, in the other drink. And um, she was very nice. She gave me, which that isn't it, but she gave... She gave me one of these glass balls, oh, oh, which I'm obsessed by, mm. and she didn't know that. But she get I don't. That isn't the one she gave me, which is upstairs. But it's the same size and the I same see. colours, and um, it was rather wonderful. There she was in this bar, mm. this huge glass, mm -hmm. and she handed me this round, beautiful glass mm. ball. Wow. So uh, I got handmaiden. The hmm? handmaiden, like yeah. Oh wow! A colourful. There's got hundreds of them. <laughs> <laughs> those are wow. just the beginning of the collection. That's what. That's what you mean by like being obsessed with those stuff. Mm. I like them because they're all the same. Mm. And they're all different. Yeah. And that's like the writing. Yeah. They look the same, but inside mm. they have a difference. So, collecting. They're beautiful things. Pro is about the kind of rivalry relation between the American scholar and mm. British scholars, especially in your book, a possession. You know, oh yes. <laughs> compete against each other to to reach the truth of. Uh, the yes, we found the. Peter found the film that was made of possession. Yeah. yeah last night, which I'd completely forgotten, uh, um, because I'm worried about films of my books, mm. I, my books are my books, but um, it was much better than I remembered. Mm. And we had it on the television and it was very badly cut. Mm. Um, there was something I was going to say that, oh yes, of course, they. it was an American film, uh -huh. so Roland, who is an archetypal yeah. Englishman. Right. right. They was he was an American. Oh, in the in the film. In the film. Oh. And he isn't bad. He is the right man <laughs> with the wrong accent. <laughs> okay. And he's got the same kind of shyness and nervousness. And everybody thought I would hate him hmm. when when the film came out. But actually I didn't. I thought he understood exactly what he was doing and mm. what sort of character he was. I see. But um, there were other people who I didn't like. Now, now I can't remember who they were. Mm. But um, 
It's a very frightening thing having films made. Have they filmed um, Puck? Park Young Nis. Yes, there are some drama, not uh, a two-hour-long film, because it's a, a serial books with a bunch, you know, yeah. many books. So there is some TV drama that there appeared in the late 1980s and 1990s. Mm. So I saw some episode when I was young, but not entirely though. Yeah, yeah. So, so anyway, so what do you think about like, uh, is there any sense of a competition among the different American and uh, British scholars? I think there increasingly is, the scholars rather than the writers. Mm. Um, the Americans on the whole assume they are better. Yeah, they are. <laughs> I mean, they, 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 they just better. know um. they are the Americans and you can come along behind. Mm. And some of the British know that they're Europeans and that our culture is much older mm. and much less narrowly nationalistic. Right, right. Um, and some don't. Uh, and it's okay because nowadays we all travel constantly yes. in aeroplanes and we go and visit each other's universities. Yes. Um, a friend of mine, a, a wonderful novelist, called Neil Mukherjee. Oh, Mukherjee. Do you know Neil? I mean, he's just rung up to say he can't come today, which... I is... could see the list of the guests invited and the name Neil Mukherjee there. You should read his books if you haven't, because he's terribly good. Okay. But um, he's interesting. Uh, uh, how did I get on to Neil? Teaching in America. Mm. Yes, he's teaching, at, he's teaching at Princeton Oh. at the moment. And he's he's like me. He's he's a perfectly good academic, and also a writer, and also a perfectly good writer. And he doesn't he doesn't find it a difficulty, okay. but he notices mm. how much more you a thing you've been talking about um, how much more defined the academic culture mm -hmm. is in the two countries. Mm -hmm. um, when I was in America, which is a long time ago now, the degree of their lack of interest in mm. Europe. Ah, oh, you're surprised. I was really surprised. I think it still exists, but mm. less because of the aeroplanes and the fellowships, and you have people like Neil turning up, who is in fact Indian from Calcutta, yeah. teaching in <laughs> Princeton. And that's wonderful. Yeah. And at the same time, he can locate what you were talking about, absolute local things mm -hmm. in pieces of writing about England or America or Calcutta. Um, it's, it's interesting actually because when I began to think about your questions, I was thinking about um, what had changed and what was academic, what was I about to say, um, and I had begun by producing a kind of cliché that everything was getting had to be more generalised because people didn't know the difficult words yeah. and the local words, but it isn't true. Mm. People learn them, people read books and they learn the words. Mm. which, in the case of the British, includes the American words. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, we, we learn, we know what they are. Yeah. I, I don't, I really... Americans are so difficult, because the ones who know English literature mm -hmm. know it better than anybody does. But anybody else doesn't know anything. <laughs> it's, it's, yes. uh, I can see Zoe nodding. It's a very weird feeling, because if they know it, they know it. Mm. Um. Sometimes I try to imagine myself put in your shoes, like, you know, as a great writer living in England, what about you traveling around the world, uh, you know, go to some places or speaking English in their own ways, <laughs> you know? <laughs> it seems like they are all unified, in, you know, in terms of speaking English. 
but at the same time there are a lot of differences like a cultural and political and social with a different accent as well so how it's terribly exciting <laughs> yeah. i mean you look at, once you start thinking about it it's it's endlessly varied and endlessly exciting yeah. and if you are english like my parents were mm. um you you have this on a very small scale they they lived in Yorkshire mm -hmm. towns, and if they went to Lancashire, it was a different language, yeah. it was a different right. group of people, mm -hmm. and you spread that out into Europe, yeah. and there were the French and the Germans, and then of course there was, there was war, mm. when war makes a... Mm. war changes everything. Yeah. You look so sad when saying... Oh, war. <laughs> well, I was thinking about, yeah, I was thinking about after the war and the sense that our world had gone somehow mm. and was having to be rebuilt. Mm. And it was a world I had inherited, but I hadn't had time mm. to have lived in it. Um, whereas now I'm old. Um, I also lived through the war, so I think about the war, but in the war. Do you still have a vivid memory of the war here mm. in England? Yeah, oh yes, mm. very strongly. So you were born in 1936? Yes. So you remember, for example, World War Two mm. in like at the age of 10 or something like that. Yeah. And I remember, you know how you have Five or six memories, I say five yeah. or six. You, there are memories of times in your life mm. that you never, never, never forget. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And never go away. And the thing that I never forget is my father, who joined the Air Force. Oh. And he joined the British Air Force before the war began. Oh. He knew there would be a war. And he joined. And I remember we were moved, we had to move house because we lived in Sheffield, which was a big industrial mm. city and it was going to be badly right. bombed. Right. And it was badly bombed. Right. And it, we went to, li to a little new house ah. in Pontefract, mm. um, which is where Richard the second was killed. Oh, uh, yes. Sorry. which I didn't know at the time. Right. But I remember standing on the stairs and my father was standing inside the door mm -hmm. and he was surrounded by these khaki bags. Right. No, not khaki. Like blue. Mm -hmm. Air Force blue. Ah, I see. And they were all different shapes and so at least that's how I remember it. And he was completely different because he had a different hat on and yeah. he had these clothes. Right. Then he went. Mm. He, he just wasn't there. Mm. And, um, and I became a person without a father. Oh, so sorry. Yeah, I, I wasn't at the time because everybody hadn't got mm. a father, you know. It, it was just like that. Yeah. People's fathers went to win. Mm. At least mine came back. Um, and much later, I, I discovered that um, there's some wonderful photographs. I think I've got them. He um, he got a holiday of about a month mm. when he was working as a Air Force lawyer mm. in Italy. Mm. And he just travelled around Europe. There are pictures of him sitting on rocks and looking at lakes. Mm. And being a European, in a way, we just weren't because mm. we were stuck in England. Um, and now I find it interesting. Mm. But then I found it terribly repressive, yeah. all this, as though there was a life that I wasn't having because of this war. Mm. And I hated Hitler for mucking my life up. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's, I, I've started reading a biography of him written by somebody who doesn't doesn't dislike him quite enough. Mm. And this is this is quite quite a nice feeling actually because you have a sense that he was somebody. 
mm -hmm. um, which you do need. Because we just we just had this monster. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Have I written about the Hitler Humpties? Hitler Humpties. You know, you know Humpty Dumpty. Yeah. Yeah. Well. Oh, I see. Kind when of... I was a little girl. Yeah, yeah. We used to make Humpties out of right, eggshells. Right. Right. And they all had his. Right. And then we would throw stones at them. <laughs> I don't, I'm not sure I've ever really written that up, but it, was, of a it really was part of my life. The solemn making of works of art that you could, mm. look like Hitler and then. Yeah. It was, it, London for a very long time was still like the war. Mm -hmm. I mean, they, they didn't mend things mm -hmm. very quickly. Mm -hmm. The houses were broken. Yeah. Everything was bombed. Um, I mean, it was, there was still bomb damage all around when I was teaching at University College in the 1980s. Mm -hmm, there mm -hmm. were houses around the college yeah, yeah. that were bombed and not yet repaired. Oh, I see. I'm trying to remember, which you don't really need to know. There's a terribly good novel about children in the war. Mm. Um, so I just quote uh, a sentence from an article that I read. It goes like this: Victorian crisis of a phase resulting from the loss of a religious certainty in the face of a scientific scientific discoveries. So it's the title of the article is about like a lost in phase, something like that. You know, it, this is part of the way he argues that you kind of find in the modern British cultures. Like, and also you try to say something about the contemporary American, uh, British cultures by adopting some scenes from the Victorian age. Mm. You know, to talking about the modern, you needed the past. Yes, because the past, the modern, the modern, is, the modern came from the past mm -hmm. and it was totally changed. By, and of course, the other way around too, uh -huh. The modern changes the past. Oh, the reconstruction of the You past. understand the past yeah. quite differently when you understand right. the present, which right. you don't, but right. you can you can try. Um, I think, again, I keep trying to remember when I was a girl, mm -hmm. you know, first reading, and I, I, one looked for people's emotions as you looked of people's relationships mm -hmm. with each other. Does she really love him? Mm -hmm. um, does he really respect her? Mm -hmm. and then bit by bit you get to see them yeah. in the whole culture. Right. And when you realise you're doing this, it's very exciting mm -hmm. as a kind of student. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, this is this is good interview. It's caused me to start thinking again. <laughs> but I was feeling so ill, I, I couldn't think at all. And I'm terribly worried by the word feminist. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, I understand. I, I think you're right. Mm. But I am of a generation older than the generation that mm. took banners and flags and right. marched out into society and said, mm. I am a feminist. Like a suffrage movement. Mm. My mother, much mm. more than me, was a feminist. Mm. She um, she was a working class woman and she went to Cambridge wow. from a Yorkshire grammar school. Wow. And um, she, uh, she was a feminist and a socialist. Oh, uh, radical. <laughs> really radical, yes. She was just unfortunately so bad tempered that mm. it was quite difficult, but she was a victim of modern society because modern society said she stayed in the kitchen. Mm -hmm. yeah. when I felt I'm very sympathetic with the, the woman from that generation. Yeah. Yes, I'm very sympathetic at the same time it drove me mad. <laughs> no, I am totally sympathetic. Mm. There's a dreadful. So I tend to think life out in stories, mm. as you will have noticed. Mm -hmm. There was a dreadful day when my father 
was made a Queen's Council, ah. which meant you end up. We went up to London from Sheffield, and he went to the Houses of Parliament, and he wore a long wig ah, yeah. and long black gowns. Like a judge. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He did became a judge, and he wore such a wig, ah. and he looked beautiful. Mm. But my mother stood in the kitchen grumbling and grumbling and saying, here I stand in the kitchen and there he is You're in, in a wig in the house of Parliament. Uh, yeah. She was right, really. I see. And I suppose my generation of women, bit by bit, we've made spaces in which yeah. it's just as likely that we will have the wig. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's a huge step forward. Right. And I don't think I did anything at all to help it, but I, I am grateful for it. Yeah, thanks to it's her, you know, <laughs> we created more room to yeah. move around. Yeah. We've created yeah. a better world in some ways. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I've, I've just remembered what it was I was going to tell you about the Germans. Germans. Um, I was terrified of them. I mean, you would be mm -hmm. if you were a child exactly. of the war. And I remember the first time I went to Germany, mm. I was a postgraduate, mm. and um, I got on a train in Holland mm. to go across Germany. Yeah. And I was sitting there surrounded by Germans, uh -huh. and a child in me wow. was terrified of the Germans, and I kept looking at them and thinking, there's bloody Germans. The language itself mm. has spoken to you. And then... There was a really awful man, a really awful man in any nationality, and he suddenly said, "The Engländer sind alle große Verbrecher." The <laughs> I can feel the, the sound of you the language it. that you're speaking. The, the English are all great um, criminals, <laughs> and everybody else. Oh. And this was interesting about the Germans. Everybody else was appalled mm. that he said this. They were terribly nice to me. They gave me sandwiches and cake. And, mm. and so it was a very... That was one of the things I shall never forget, like my father putting his clothes on to go into the war. I shall never forget that German train. Mm. Um, and now I have lots and lots of really good friends who are Germans. And, Poor old Germans. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of them weren't the enemy. Well, they were the enemy. One, we were talking about it last night. We went to my little granddaughter's mm. um, eighth birthday party and we were sitting around with my son-in-law and my daughter and a little girl talking about Germans. don't know how we got on to Germans. Mm. But... Um, he, he's coming today, I think. Mm. He's very interesting because he's very much from the north of England. Mm. Mm. Then, uh, number five, somehow you covered this. Uh, we we done that one. Yeah, like uh, something that you try to portray in your work, something beyond simply being realistic. Mm. Like uh, you somehow repudiate the notion of realism in... Uh, writing yeah. a story yes. so if there is something more than just simply remaining realistic then how would you define it in your words? Um, it's there in the language really. Realistic novelists use a certain vocabulary which describes things and social actions mm -hmm. um, but my sort of person uses the language of philosophy mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and the language of religion. I mean, I'm I totally see. irreligious, but um, nevertheless, I know about religion. Mm -hmm. And I think those languages are part of the way right. the world is and the novel should be. Mm -hmm. Well, my novels should be. I think that there are very good narrowly social novels, but I don't want to write one. So. I thought I used to say, if um, if you really want to change people's lives, you go out and teach. You don't write novels. Um, I'm not sure that's true. 
So there are certain language that is not fully covered by simply language, the language of a portraying reality you know, in a very spiritual way. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, My immediate response, which I will tell you because it's interesting, uh, was that it's very dangerous. <laughs> um, it's dangerous if you fall in love. Ah, oh, yeah. Yeah. It's dangerous if you love somebody too much. Mm. It's dangerous if it stops. Ah, yeah. <laughs> I, um, I see. As a married man, I can I can sense what you're saying. Yeah. You see what I mean? Um, and and also, I was thinking this morning. I've been married an awful long time, and here I am, very contented. And mm. how improbable that is, really. Mm. But um, the other thing about love is that when people are in it, it is all, mm. and they get completely carried away by love, yes. and love is who they are, and who they are is love. Yes. And there is this, I think I, I think Iris actually said, there is a wonderful moment when you fall out of love, mm. and suddenly you're not in love, but the whole of the world exists again. Oh. And I love that. I love that feeling that the world isn't just love. Um, Interesting. And it's, I think, one of the things I most love about writing novels is describing a world which is more than just love. Mm -hmm. And so many novels are just love. And very good novels are just love. Mm -hmm. But... Um, the things that aren't love and still exist mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. if you're a human being it is so surprising that we are capable of being so interested in so much mm -hmm. think? I think that's what I like about human beings you give them a plant or mm -hmm. a rabbit or right. a, an idea of history and they go and find out about it um, whereas there was a horrid great cat going round and round my oh. swimming pool this morning. It was mm. just thinking about how to get to the next place. It wasn't. Mm -hmm. And I looked at it and I felt a certain amount of envy because I felt so ill and it was... Ah. <laughs> <laughs> but um, anyway, that's what I think about love. Yeah, I've been happily married. Mm. It's a second marriage and I've been Mm -hmm. Like many people, you do it wrong once, yeah. and then you do it right, right. and that has been that has been very very good, and and I love the children. Mm -hmm. Learning through love, mm -hmm. and, and the grandchildren. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I was good. I, I was quite good at being a girl at Cambridge, mm -hmm. without meaning to and without understanding. Mm -hmm, mm. But um, I, and I was scared all the time. Oh. It took a long time to be able to enjoy myself, but I, mm. I can now. If I could stop being ill, I would really enjoy myself. Dave, would you try to uh, say some of the last words to our Korean audience? They say hello, like, you know, um, you know, to greet them. What I want to say um, is how very sorry I am that I wasn't well enough to come mm -hmm. and that I fully intend to yeah, come to Korea. Yeah. I really would like to go. I went to Korea very briefly, really. Mm. I was on the way to China. Ah. And... Um, there long enough. And mm. It's always been there, in my, and having read Park Park Young Lee, Park Young Lee, um, even more, I have a sense of the nature of it. Once you start, uh, we've been talking all the time about work. Mm -hmm. Once you start reading Korean literature, mm -hmm. you need to read another one and another yeah. one, and then it fits into your map of the world better. Yeah. So great. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah.
you know, I can, you know, I can sense that you probably must be very, you know, exhausted, you know, for a long hours conversation with me. I'm very thank you, I'm grateful to you for doing this with me. Well, thank you. They are very good questions, as oh, I thank you. <laughs>